You have transported people such as Justin Bieber, Mariah Carey, Warren Buffett, even the richest family in the United States, the Waltons. That's just to name a few. How did an ex-convict become one of the most sought after VIP and celebrity chauffeurs amongst the rich and famous? And how did you become so successful? When, uh, when Ray got out of prison, his sister called me. My brother is getting out. What, what do you think he should do? Like, he's been away so long. I, I, I got to find something for him to do. I says, tell him to become a chauffeur. He'll have time for himself. He won't have a boss on his neck, on his back. He'll be able to have time for him to reflect that he's out. So Ray got out of prison and came and signed up as a chauffeur and he loved it he loved it he suited up every day he came he did what needed to be done and to my amazement you know going from being a chauffeur to being a VIP chauffeur and seeing him at the mansions at MGM driving around in a Jaguar a Bentley I was like, wow, Ray really, you know, made this work for him. How does Ray Torres become successful after doing almost 20 years in federal prison? Well, for one, he was very smart. You can't be a, you can't be a dummy and sell drugs and get to the level he was. But Ray's always been smart. He was successful in the dope game, and he's successful now. It was only a matter of time that he was going to get into something to elevate him into something positive and something good and some, something profitable. Ray had the intelligence and he used it in the wrong way in the past, but now he's using it for the positive. And look at him now. After being released from prison, a friend of mine suggested that I get a job as a chauffeur. It was during the time where the economy wasn't doing so well. So working for the company after a few months, I thought about quitting. But something inside told me just, just to tough it out. So when the next big convention was in town, all the chauffeurs with the company were exhausted because there were so many clients that came in. So the office called me in. They asked me if I was ready to drive one of their VIPs. Of course I said yes. So they trusted me to drive a Mercedes S550. It was a four day charter and it was one of the biggest executives for a aviation company. After the first day, the client's secretary called the office, requested me for the next three days. And she said that the client didn't want any other chauffeur but me. And so that's how my VIP career started. I'm an automotive lifestyle concierge. My client reach uh, goes across all boards from executive VIPs, uh, NFL, NBA, hip hop artists that are in need of high-end white glove executive ground transportation. For me and my brand and my image, uh, it's very important that I hand select the right individual to interact with my clients and represent the brand and the vehicles and a level of professionalism that isn't going to harm the rest of the team. I was fortunate enough to meet Ray on a detail in Las Vegas, Nevada. For many years, I have taken care of a lot of the crew from Cash Money Records and their movements throughout the US, Miami, New York, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, I would be on location taking care and handling ground transportation and other needs they may have. I was on a detail in Las Vegas one night 
where we had extra vehicles that we needed because of the size of the crew. And while posted up, Ray and I met each other and realized that there were a lot of similarities uh, in what we did, and that was basically the start of our friendship. You know, when I came to Las Vegas eight years ago, and uh, I had a shorter list of athletes and celebrities that I had uh, represented. Uh, we had a very high profile uh, business uh, billionaire coming into town, and I needed to have the absolute best driver available. I called uh, a friend of mine in uh, Mike Tyson's camp who, who deals very closely with Mike and arranges all of his transportation, and Ray was the top of the list. He said, this is the only guy that you need to call, one phone number, he'll get everything done that you need. And that was the beginning of my relationship with Ray. With OSP Sports and Entertainment, Lace Up Promotions, and really any of the businesses that I'm involved with, we have a lot of high profile athletes, entertainers, artists, celebrities, talent, uh, businessmen and women that come into town. And it's essential to ensure that we have VIP chauffeur assistance, uh, care, and uh, giving them the absolute best experience they can when they arrive in Las Vegas. So making sure that we have all of those things afforded to them and allocated for them, it could be the difference between making a deal and not making a deal. A typical day for me can be transporting a client to a convention or to a business meeting, or maybe taking them out on the strip to play. I could be taking a rap artist to a video shoot, or I can be taking Warren Buffett to Floyd Mayweather's gym. VIPs visit Las Vegas from all over the world for a variety of reasons. I was introduced to Ray Torres while working in Las Vegas. My first impression of him was that of extreme professionalism. After working with Ray, I discovered he was not only professional, but diligent, efficient, personable, and provided the highest level of executive service imaginable. Ray has a natural instinct. He is street smart and security smart. I've used him in Mexico and frequently use him in the U.S. He has always been one step ahead of me when planning. Ray makes clients feel safe and that's what they're looking for. I've worked with chauffeurs and security teams from all over the world. Ray Torres is definitely one of the best. A special work detail is usually a work assignment outside of Las Vegas or outside of the United States. But there are special work details in Vegas as well. A special work detail consists of transporting an iconic rock band or a world famous singer. Or I can be traveling outside of the US transporting clients in their own country. A special work detail is usually a detail that I have full control over and one that I coordinate. After spending time with Ray and using him as my personal driver when I would come to Las Vegas, I realized that he presented the qualities of being a highly polished chauffeur. Uh, he also recognized, you know, my business qualities and the kind of business that I was running up in Portland and we believed that together uh, we could provide you know an all-star team. What stood out the most to me when I met Ray was his appearance quite frankly. Um, this industry a lot of guys can throw on a suit but how they wear that suit and wearing it uh, you know with pride um, I really noticed that Ray had those qualities in him. Uh, everything from his vest to his gloves to just his appearance, everything was on point and it was exactly what I would want uh, is that appearance that Ray presented. And appearance is everything and everybody's always watching, especially when you're in that limelight. I wear these leather gloves for a variety of reasons. One, they look stylish. 
Two, they're good for driving and gripping the steering wheel. Three, the temperature in Vegas in the summertime gets over 100 degrees. We're driving black vehicles. The vehicles get very hot when you touch them, especially when you open up the doors. Without the gloves, you leave fingerprints all over the vehicles. But the number one reason why I wear these gloves is because they're laced with Kevlar. They're like body armor. When somebody's trying to stop the vehicle, they usually attack the chauffeur first. And these gloves will help fight off a knife attack. And that's all part of thinking ahead and being prepared for the unexpected. To be a VIP chauffeur honestly takes years of experience and knowledge of being able to think like your client, knowing one or two steps ahead their wants and needs and preparing with a backup plan for every plan having the ability to take care of those needs on the fly is basically what gives you value in being a VIP chauffeur. To be a VIP chauffeur, you gotta be intelligent. You gotta know how to read people. It's not just about having the car polished up or providing the necessities in the vehicle like the water and phone chargers. You gotta be knowledgeable of everything that goes on in the area that you are transporting that client. When there's traffic, you gotta know which routes to take and which routes not to take. You gotta know when to speak and when not to speak. You gotta always think ahead of your client because there's gonna be curveballs that are gonna be thrown at you. Uh, I was fortunate enough to receive a call from Ray uh, one day where he was asked to take care of a very large wedding uh, down in Big Bear, California with a number of vehicles, 20 hours a day, five days in a row. Ray felt that I could assist in not only backing him uh, in that arena, but he knew that he needed a wingman to take care of this high profile family. It's not every day that you get a call from the Walmart family asking them to handle one of their family members' weddings. And so Ray knew that I would be able to cover his back in that situation. After that detail, going off smooth as silk, uh, I was fortunate enough to receive a call uh, asking my team in Portland to handle the most iconic rock band in, in US history, in my opinion, to get a call to service and drive the Rolling Stones. is like winning the Super Bowl. And I knew that the intensity and the level of professionalism was gonna be, you know, the highest it could be. And I needed Ray by my side for those days uh, in Seattle. How many chauffeurs do you know who have their own chauffeur? <laughs> That's the... Uh transportation coordinator Mark he's running the show here today he's the lead the vehicles have to be clean at all times the temperatures have to be set at a certain degree so um, you got to be very very meticulous on the things you do when especially when it comes to these type of uh, clients I'm a man, I'm a man.
Operation Black Leather Gloves is complete. It was nice working with my boy Mark. This is the same airport in Portland that I took back to Vegas when I was released from prison. It just dawned on me, I didn't realize it until I walked through here and I'm like, wait a minute, this looks familiar. So April 5th, 2011, it brought me back when I first got released, walking through this airport. I couldn't believe that I was free. I had to pinch myself after serving 18 years in federal prison. So this is, uh, I'm just gonna have to reflect on this for a minute kind of uh, let it sink in. Being around the rich and famous, you get to experience and enjoy some of the life with them. And sometimes crumbs fall off the table. I've had clients take me on vacations, take me on shopping sprees, give me envelopes stuffed with Benjamins, and invite me as a VIP guest to their concerts. When you have the right clients, they take care of you. They treat you like family. Hi. So because of her, we're here. She's like, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> special event with the Rolling Stones tonight? I'm enjoying it. Yeah, I'm excited. Very, very excited. That one of the few legends that are left, so I have to see them. Fuck COVID. I live for today. That's it. I'm not waiting for another year. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. <laughs> That's, That's it. Salute. I drive every vehicle on the fleet, as well as vehicles off the fleet. The Maybach, the Mercedes S560, Cadillac Escalade, Audi luxury sedan, super stretch Humvee, 32 passenger executive bus. But my two favorite vehicles would have to be the Rolls Royce Phantom and the Rolls Royce Ghost. Top of the line luxury vehicles by far. No question. A VIP chauffeur has 
many written and unwritten rules. It's important to know what you're doing as a professional chauffeur. By nature, one should always think ahead. Plan for the unexpected. Learn as much as you can about your client, their likes, their dislikes, the type of water they prefer, the type of gum they chew. VIP clients pay attention to detail. So a VIP chauffeur must always be on his top game. And the cardinal rule, never share your client's business with anyone, especially to other clients. Making that mistake can cost a chauffeur his reputation, his client, and more important, his cash flow. A beginner chauffeur averages about $40,000 a year. Experienced chauffeurs average about $150,000 to $200,000 a year for an A-list celebrity client. I've earned $35,000 in five days working for a client on a major event. What a chauffeur earns all depends on what professional level he is on and how satisfied the client is. Happy clients tend to give generously. One of the busiest nights of the year, New Year's Eve, we're out here. Uh, this is where a lot of the big clients come into town. Um, they usually block off the strip at five o'clock, so there's not gonna be any traffic that's gonna be able to go up and down the strip because people are gonna be walking. But um, definitely a busy night, a lot going on. Um, one thing about being a VIP chauffeur, you gotta know all the back roads. You gotta know which routes to take, especially uh, if you've been doing this for a while and you got to get clients from point A to point B and usually they're on a they're running behind time and usually they want you to get there get them there ASAP so um, it helps to know all the back roads sometimes we have paparazzi that follow us sometimes you got fans sometimes you got you know a lot of people that you know some people are a little nuts and they'll, they'll follow you wherever you go and um, one of the ways that we lose them is uh, there's many different ways, but you know the professional chauffeurs uh, know how to lose them right away. So I'm gonna go ahead and take you guys down that route and show you what we do once uh, once we try to lose these uh, people that we don't want following our vehicles. So this tunnel. I call it the Bugsy Siegel Tunnel. And this is like a paparazzi or if you got some weirdos trying to follow us and you want to lose them, you just take them down this little escape route and it leads on to Desert Inn. That's just one of the routes, but Vegas has a lot of tunnels, a lot of back doors, a lot of back roads, a lot of escape routes. Um, you just have to know them. Not too many chauffeurs know them, but a lot of VIP chauffeurs, they should know them, especially if they're, you know, transporting their VIPs and they want to lose somebody. This is one of the private airports where uh, a lot of the VIPs, the whales, the high rollers, the celebrities fly into, and uh, usually when we get the call, we we come here and uh, we check in at the office, and then when the uh, the plane has touched down, then we go onto the tarmac. We usually go through this little gate right here. Once we get the phone call, once we verify the vehicle, we go ahead and we uh, we roll onto the tarmac. We pull up to one of these planes. We load our passenger. Then we roll on out. All in a day's work. Yeah, go ahead, Manny. All right, so 
I got a rapper. His name is mm-hmm. from Chicago. He's with some chicks, and they got a uh, they got 19 people that want to go to Mayweather's club tonight. Let me confirm it first. I'll call you right back. Okay. 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 Bye. Rick. Yes. Okay. So uh, yeah, they said it's a goal. So yeah. So let me try to see a way that we can arrange it, cause I I think I won't be there till ten thirty myself. Mm-hmm. Um. So I was just trying to see, cause I I can't process the credit card or anything till I actually get there. Okay. Okay. Um. So yeah, I mean, I guess I I mean they can get there. I mean, I can take them at ten thirty. I mean, but I just want to make sure that everything's reserved and make sure it's locked in before then. If there's any way we can do that. Okay. Yeah. What I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um. I'm going to make a call right quick, and I'm going to call you right back. Okay, okay, call me back. All right, okay. All right. All right bye. Okay, Manny, I talked to my guy. Can you talk? Yeah. Okay, so 19 people is a lot of people. He said he can't get them on the floor, but he's got a place upstairs for all 19 people. And this is his price, what he's giving us. He said he can do that for 8000 Eight. So, and I haven't. He said they are giving no kickbacks. So, whatever it is, we would have to add on to that. Ninety-five hundred. You want? You want to put ninety-five hundred? Uh huh. Okay, and we're splitting that or what? Yeah. We're splitting. Okay. 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 All right. All right. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, let me know what he okay. let me know what he says, and if he's gonna lock it in, I'll send him an invoice for a deposit, and then I'll hook him up with the guy there where he can pay the rest at the club. How's that? That way we you get. Got it. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me know. Okay. Bye bye. I'll take seven hundred fifty dollars in a night's nice work for making phone calls. That's what it's all about, making that cheddar. From time to time, clients invite me to some of their events. Clients love to visit Vegas to work and to play. And at times I am invited to play with them. Being a VIP chauffeur is one of the most amazing jobs in Las Vegas. Against all odds, we push in against all odds. Despite of everything, We going against all odds. We pushing against all odds. Despite of everything, we get the victory. Against all odds, gotta navigate through the snakes and fries. Look inside the game, it's a big mirage. Everybody paint in a big facade. You will get played if you don't stay sharp. Blood in the water, that's full of sharks. Blood sucking motherfuckers beat you dry. Don't know how to play, then you will get got. Don't know how to move, then you will get right. Don't nobody really wanna see you win. Every time you win, they start talking shit. Everybody hating, they got some pit. And this whole game full of politics. I don't really give it to that crock of shit. Got so many haters trying to ride my dick. You would think they really wanna swallow it. No mom is bitch, with a smile to your face and a knife in your back. And it's tarnished the faith in the my fellow man. Everybody play. Get a part of this game, so the game is a giant garbage can. Trust nobody, the game is cold. And the devil really wanna come and take your soul. Record execs wanna take control. Don't fall for the game, it'll swallow you whole. Against all odds, we push in against all odds. Despite of everything, we get the victory. There are so many great celebrities that I have driven. Jennifer Lopez, Mel Gibson, Dwayne Johnson. But if I had to narrow it down to a wish list of four, I would pick Benicio Del Toro, director Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu, Denzel Washington, and Leonardo DiCaprio who I've had the honor to drive. I believe that Ray had a lot of time to be rehabilitated. And during that time, instead of worrying about the fact that he was having to go to prison, he worked on what he was gonna do when he got out of prison and perfected his craft and studied and read books and knew that this day would come. 
and he wanted to be the best that he could be to prove not only to himself, but I think to society that the system works. You could be Ray Torres that didn't go to prison and because of you wanting to be the best VIP chauffeur that you can be, you know, you treat it like a lifestyle, which it, it is, and you have to live it 24 seven and you are never taking your foot off the gas in perfecting your craft, right? Which is an, an ever changing craft and you have to adapt, uh, you know, not only with the client, but with the industry, uh, there's ups and downs and you know, there's good times and there's bad times. And I think if you're going to be a successful VIP chauffeur like Ray is, you've got to constantly be working to be the best you can be. If someone were to ask why hire an ex-felon and put him around high profile people, I would say that my past doesn't define who I am today. I would say my past experiences make me who I am today. Growing up in the Los Angeles Harbor area in a war zone, spending 18 years in prison, all those factors make a person more aware of their surroundings. I am able to read body language. I am able to sense when danger is near. And I believe that gives me the upper hand when dealing with high profile people. You know, coming out of prison after 18 years lets you know who you really are. Ray has totally embraced where he is in life, who he is, what he represents, what hat he wears. Many times in life, you know, we wear different hats. Do we want to be the uh, comedian in life? Do we want to be the tough guy? Do we want to be the nice guy? Do we want to be the humble guy? Do we want to be the successful entrepreneurial, uh, you know, on social media, uh, flamboyant kind of guy? But what Ray is, is he's a man that knows who he is, where he stands, and what he wants. And he stops at nothing to get it. He doesn't worry about, you know, the workload that's in front of him. He works on having stronger shoulders to be able to carry that workload and he knows he's up against it. Listen, you bring up Ray's rap sheet, no one's, no one normal banker, no normal corporate America is gonna hire him. So what he does is he humbly picks himself up off the ground and goes to work. Chin down, bites down on that mouthpiece and doesn't stop until he gets what he wants. And that's why Ray is in the position that he is right now. I'm a former military policeman, former Los Angeles Police Department officer, former DEA agent that was convicted and sent to federal prison on a drug conspiracy. Ray and I met at Terminal Island Federal Institution, Los Angeles. One day I happened to be uh, talking to one of the inmate doctors. There were a lot of doctors in prison also for Medicare, Medi-Cal frauds and stuff like that. And he suggested I look a guy up that was there in the prison named Ray Torres, who was a exceptionally well-spoken, somewhat of a leader, and spent all of his time in the law library writing scripts. Uh, this doctor had known that I had been in movies. He'd seen me and heard me about Enter the Dragon and some of the movies with Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris. So I said, fine, uh, let me know if you see the guy and I'll approach him. Well, as it would turn out, one evening in Toastmasters class, somehow or another, Ray showed up to watch, look, and listen. He didn't know that I hadn't watched in the visiting room when visiting juvenile offenders were brought to the prison on a semi-scared straight program, and I'd watched him in his oration speaking to the kids. I've met all kind of inmates. I've met all kind of recidivists. You can pretty much judge the character of a person in prison, just like you can when you're in the Army, on how they conduct themselves daily. Ray was exceptional. 
When I saw him mentor the kids, when I saw him answer their questions, when I saw him actually touch them, I could watch the kids and tell which ones were trying to wake up and find out what was going on. Ray spent his time being productive, helping others, and I would say unselfishly. You know, when I first met Ray, um, he was very quiet, almost too quiet. Um, I'm a little bit loud, uh, egocentric, um, and, you know, in your face, and Ray is a lot, he's the polar opposite of me. And that's what really attracted me to him was how professional he was, uh, his demeanor, how calm it was. But there was something, there was an underlying attraction to Ray that I had in a business sense and in a professional standpoint. And it wasn't until five years into our relationship that I really uh, knew and found out uh, Ray's backstory. And, and I think that was what really made me appreciate, value, and respect him even more uh, in doing what he does. I grew up in Wilmington. And you had the projects there. You had drug dealers, you had gangbangers, you had street hoods. Those were the type of role models that I grew up around. I was influenced by my surroundings. When you have those type of role models, eventually, you're gonna get involved in the criminal activity that goes along with the city. I got involved with drugs because I was kicked out on the street at age 16. And it was either make it or break it for me. I figured, hey, if I sell drugs and I make it, then hey, I'm gonna be on top. If I sell drugs and I get busted, it's better than sleeping on the street. At least I have three meals, a cot to sleep on, and a roof over my head. Being influenced by the younger kids that were selling drugs, that had the new clothes and the new shoes, and I seen kids that had lowrider cars with hydraulics and Dayton's parked in the driveway, and they weren't even old enough to drive. And I'm over here walking around with holes in my shoes. To me, it was a no-brainer. I borrowed $20 from this girl that lived across the street who liked me, and I told her that I would pay her back within a week. With that $20, I went to the local street drug dealer, and I got a double up. Double up $20 rock, which was 40. I broke it in half and I sold it. Came back with 40. Got another double up 40 from the local drug dealer. I continued to do that until I was buying ounces. And then once I graduated to ounces, I got hooked up with the uh, Mexican drug dealers and I got involved in buying quarter kilos and kilos. As my successes escalated in the streets, I started buying cars, materialistic things. I started, you know, you start showing off as a kid, especially if you grew up not having any money. And people start getting jealous. Then the police start recognizing you and people start dropping dimes on you. The point that made me want to move out of Wilmington was when one of my clients came to the house to buy some, a sack of dope. And the next day he called me, he said that when he went to work, his boss told him that, hey, stay away from the house that you were at the night before, it's a known drug dealer. So I found out that the, the guy worked at a tire company and they used to do all the Metro police officers' cars there. So one of the police officers told his boss and he came back and told me that they're watching me. So it wasn't hard for me to uh, figure out what I had to do. So I packed up my bags, I packed up my goods, and uh, I brought a sack with me and I moved to Las Vegas. Vegas had became criminal college for me. And I learned everything from chop shops to stolen goods to credit card fraud. I had learned about drugs that I had never even heard of. If there was money to be made, I wanted a piece of it. The first time I met Ray, my brother brought him to the house. I thought that was cool, man, because I always wanted to meet him. I didn't know him. We just heard about him. And at the time, a lot of us who were selling dope were trying to get into the dope game, and we knew Ray was a dude to see.
Ray was coming from Vegas to LA, back to Vegas, and we knew he was rolling. And a lot of us grew up poor in the hood, and we wanted what he had. We wanted to be Ray. That was the guy we looked up to. And when my brother brought him over, I was excited, man. It was like, almost like meeting the celebrity. And then word hit the street. He got arrested. Being in prison is a, definitely a hard pill to swallow. But I think it's also a time where people can go and do some soul searching. A lot of times our mind is clouded by the crime, by the money, by the fast life, and, and we don't see the end result until it hits us uh, smack in the face. All it takes is one simple mistake and you can spend the rest of your life in prison. Once your freedom is taken from you, and you get it back, most people appreciate it. Prison usually makes a man bitter or better. And I chose to be better. When I was in prison in Sheridan, uh, the first time I met Ray, I had a, a honed sense of evaluation of somebody's character. I generally knew who was uh, a little bit more of a solid person that I'd want to associate with and who wasn't. First time I ever really spoke with Ray, I became aware that he'd been to a number of other prisons. He was serving a long sentence, uh, much longer than mine. And uh, I sensed, all, my, my natural senses were that he was more of a trustworthy type of person. As I got to know him over a couple of years in Sheridan throughout 2009, 10, and 11, that was affirmed more and more. I knew that he was somebody that really spent a lot of time with uh, investing in self, which is something that I really appreciate because I, I did that as well. Um, you know, countless hours on the track working out, always reading a book. You walk by the TV room in prison and there's a certain crowd of people that are always watching ESPN every single day or some sort of soap operas or reality shows. That was never Ray. I, I don't think I ever saw him doing that. He was always reading some kind of book or doing something that was highly productive. And I could see that he clearly had a focus that he was gonna be doing something big when he got out. And I had one thing that I kept with me, which was my Rolodex of numbers of people. I had uh, evaluated a lot of people and become friends with a number of people throughout the prison time. And there was a s not small, but not large number of people that I wanted to at least have some sort of contact with and and uh, Ray was one of them and so I knew he lived here and I looked him up called him one day and I had no uh, ideas of what he was up to I hadn't talked to him for years actually and he told me about a program that he was in which sounded interesting he said that he was working with youth offenders and um, kids that were potentially offenders in a program called Real Talk and he just described it to me a little bit and said I should come check it out. I thought about it and I did. I took him up on that and that's uh, where I actually saw him in first or in reality uh, for the first time in a number of years. I got involved working with kids um, after I was incarcerated. I think that's when I really opened up my eyes that you know I needed to become a different person. I really wanted to give back to the youth because the experience that I have, you know, growing up, bumping heads with my parents, um, you know, being kicked out on the streets, uh, you know, I, I know what a lot of youth are going through, um, dropping out of high school. People are not born killers, murderers, or criminals. I believe it all starts off at home, you know, with the environmental influences that later lead into the decisions people make. 
that's why it's important when I talk to the, the parents that, you know what, it's their responsibility to make sure that their kids are raised the right way. Uh, like the old saying goes, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Um, nowadays, we see kids doing you know, home invasion robberies. We see, you know, there's stories where I heard about boys um, catching this girl on fire. I mean, and, you know, breaking into old people's homes and trying to steal things. You know, a lot of these kids want to be gangsters, but it's one thing that, uh, you know, wanting to be something, but when you're actually living the lifestyle, it's a whole different ball game. And that's what these kids need to realize. It's not a movie. It's not a play. It's not Disneyland. You know, it's real life. When you're faced with a, a life and death situation, having to take someone's life or protect your life. I met Raymond Torres on a home visit I was I was employed with the federal probation officer uh, I actually was covering one of our officers cases as he was out of the office and um, I was given some cases to, to uh, visit the homes of and um, to, to do a background basically check investigation to make certain that uh, where he's living uh, stated on paper is exactly where he is, he was living so um, I went to his house um, in place of his normal uh, federal probation officer and uh, conducted a home visit. And we sat and chat, uh, chatted about um, what he was doing with his life and uh, his background. And I, I got to learn more about him with the conversations that we had at the, um, the home. And um, he proceeded to share with me, you know, his interests that he's had in the past before uh, going into prison. And uh, it really piqued my interest even more because I was already in the realm of creating uh, the Real Talk Youth Impact Program. So we started talking more in depth about the youth and uh, he proceeded to show me some information, some documentation about his scripts and what he was doing inside um, to continue to fulfill his dream, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, my, my, whole, my whole view in life is if you don't put it on paper, it doesn't exist. And so that's what really struck me about Ray, because he had things in, in, on paper of his visions and what he wanted in his life uh, to better his life. And so I, I really kept him in the forefront of my mind after leaving that home. Um, I actually, when I went back to the office, I pulled up his file and started reading more about his case. And um, I, I found that uh, Ray would be a great asset to the program, um, very well-spoken and um, having the background that he had as far as in the, the criminal justice system, um, you would not gather th the fact that he was actually incarcerated for that long. So I was very impressed and excited to know that he was excited about the program that I had was going actually on the mission to create. The kids have a very sharp appreciation for reality. I would say a high reality quotient and they are able to sense BS. There's been a number of people in Real Talk that I've met over the years who are speakers. They come and go. There's been some that are more authentic than others, and some that are less authentic than others. And I think that the kids can tell quickly. You look at the crowd, and I'll, I'll watch a crowd when somebody's up there speaking. Some of the, the kids have rapt attention some of the kids are dozing off, some of them aren't paying attention at all. And usually it's because the, they have a heightened sense. Uh, when, when a police officer is talking to them or somebody who's coming from a perce perceived position of authority, you can see that they don't often believe the story or they don't listen. It's good advice that they're getting, but this person that's talking to them hasn't lived the story. And when we're talking about <clears throat> a story that involves all of the different uh, elements that would go into the background making of somebody who could be a potential criminal. Those are things that the kids will know that uh, if they're gonna listen to the advice of somebody, they need to know that that person knows what they're talking about and that they can fully evaluate that. I, I've heard Ray's story at this point, probably 30 times, maybe. It's been seven years we rotate when we speak, and he's been the most consistent person in the program, has always been there, 
And so I've heard him, his story many, many times, different variants of it. I've read his book as well, and also different personal conversations that we've had. The reason why I, I really like Ray's stories is that he goes into a number of, of different facets of his background and he's really done all of the things that he says. There's nothing that has been, you know, procured for the sake of the entertainment there. Nothing's been fluffed up. Nothing's been fabricated at all, you know, for the fame. Uh, there doesn't need to be. Um, when you do, you know, a 20 year prison sentence, 20 year plus, there's no, there's no fabrication to it. It's very real. Your life is going to be ruined. You're going to be locked in a cage for a very long time. You're going to have no control over your life. And if you're able to captivate an audience and tell them even just a little bit of what that's like, then you will have their attention. You're definitely going to command their respect. People that come out of prison, uh, and in particular for Raymond, uh, the extensive amount of time that he did in custody, uh, it, it's, it's really a difficult task to meet in being successful in the community, um, let alone even if it's two or three years coming back out to try and recreate your life and start pretty much from scratch. Um, statistically, you know, the numbers are alarming because the, the average um, the average of uh, reoffending or recidivism in our nation is over 70 percent with people who come out of the institution. So with Ray, you know, coming out and, you know, of course he didn't have a job right away and, and the chauffeur job, uh, from what I gather, he, you know, it fell in his lap and what the discussions that we've had over the years and even in his um, meetings with me early on upon his uh, uh, arrival back to the community. And with, with him being a chauffeur and being amongst the, the rich and the famous, if you will, um, that's a slippery slope for somebody who's been in custody for such a long time, who has a background with dealing drugs and even using drugs. Uh, because let's face it, you know, where there's rich and famous, you have drugs and alcohol and other propositions that he would be subject to. And it's very commending that he didn't indulge himself in that and end up in our system. So that speaks volumes as well, because the, the level of possibilities there and taking the wrong route are very, very high. And for him to be amongst the rich and the famous, driving all over the, the United States, essentially, uh, and being able to have that in his hand and not actually indulge is pretty impressive. I could tell that Ray was among a certain group of people. I would say it's about 20% of people that would, uh, when you get out of prison, you, if I was a betting man, which I am, I would say that they, that is a person that will have a, a degree of success that will exceed what would be the, uh, the average level that you would expect. Now, I was surprised to hear how, how Ray was doing. Um, he, you know, I, I wonder, does he have some sort of connections or something? What has he got going on? And of course, you always wonder, um, is everything that somebody's doing on the up and up? Because I've heard a number of different friends say I'm doing this or that, and it sounds impressive. And then I find out it's a cover for some sort of crime that they're doing. And uh, in Ray's case, I could see that he was the real deal. Um, you know, watching him gain his experience as a celebrity chauffeur, and uh, take all these different number of trips and meet all kinds of famous people and hear the things that they would say about him. That's the real proof in the pudding. Um, you know, what does somebody else say about a person when they're not around? And it's not designed to just, you know, um, boost their ego, but it's just a genuine appraisal of character. And so, you know, I would hear those things and I knew that he would do well. Um, that's the reason why I called him in the first place. I think that I have a pretty good sense of uh, who would be the successful people that I knew, and I tried to keep in contact with most of those people in that Rolodex that I mentioned earlier. A lot of people ask me, was it hard for me to adjust back into society? And, you know, for me, 
honestly, I thought that it was easy walking out of prison because while I was in prison, just because my body was locked up, my mind was never locked up. I was always in the books. I was always studying. So when I was released from prison, I felt like I didn't even skip a beat. I just kept on going. To me, me going to prison, going through all the hard times, it was my training ground. So I can reach out and work with kids who might be going through the same thing. I can share my experiences, my stories of bad choices. And today I can honestly say that that I'm blessed and I'm glad I went through everything that I went through because I believe it happened for a reason. Well, looking at Ray's overall success in the community as we speak today uh, is pretty much a, an example of letting the world know that ex-felons are redeemable. They're human. They make mistakes. And for him to come out after 20 years and be able to transform his life and re visit all the things in the community that he had lost is commendable. Uh, I think that people in society need to look at people who've been in prison, not with just a F on their back as a felon, but look at those folks as he too, she too can be redeemed, can come back in the community and really, really become productive citizens. One of my contacts in Vegas had $2 million worth of stolen artwork that belonged to Las Vegas entertainer Wayne Newton. And it was my job to try to sell it on the black market. So I brokered a deal where I was gonna trade the artwork for, uh, for 50 kilos of cocaine, 110 pounds of cocaine. So in 1995, I got arrested in a reverse sting operation. And for a first time nonviolent drug offense, I was sentenced to 19 years, seven months. Now, is anybody older than 19 in here, the kids? Raise your hand. So that means, that means I've been in prison longer than you've been alive. Because that's what the feds will do to you. For a first time nonviolent drug offense. How many can do 19 years in prison? Raise your hand. Nobody wants to do 19 years in prison. You shouldn't have to. And the reason why we're here is because we don't want you to spend 19 years in prison. We don't want, to, we don't want you to spend a day in prison. How many of you are disrespecting your parents at home? I want to raise it. This is real talk. I mean, everybody's hands should be up right now. Everybody. Nobody's ever disrespected their parents at home? Nobody? Ever. Ever. Okay, so we got some people that are in denial. Yeah, raise your hand. Raise your hand. The reason why I'm bringing up respect is because do you know what it's like to be in prison? Do you even have an idea what it's like to be in prison with men that are never getting out? Do you know what respect is? One of the biggest things that you have to have or give in prison is respect. Now, I'm going to give you an example how being disrespectful can cost you your life in prison. And this is, these are true stories. When I was at a certain prison, there were, you know, you, we have the chow line where you're waiting in line, right? All the inmates are waiting in line to get their milk. Some knucklehead decided to cut everybody off and go in front of that whole line that's waiting. And you were talking about inmates, we're talking about some of these guys got 10, 20, 30 years, life sentences, two life sentences, three life sentences. So the knucklehead that cut everybody off in the line, somebody followed them back to the unit and they stuck them, but they didn't stick them just one time, they, they stuck him multiple times, they stabbed him multiple times. Why do you think he did that? Because he disrespected them. So what happens if you go to prison and you disrespect somebody that's never getting out? 
You know, somebody that's never, not everybody thinks this way, but you got guys that are never getting out of prison, right? Some guys that are locked in the shoe, right? Some guys are not, but they want to get out of the prison. So you know what they do? They're looking for a victim. Stab the hell out of this guy, get taken, go to court. He gets out, he gets to drive around, see the city locked up in chains, of course, on a bus, gets to eat, and then he comes back with another life sentence. You think he cares if he takes a man's life, if he already has three, four, five life sentences? You think he cares? He don't care. These are the type of people that you're going to be around when you're on the other side of the fence. That's why we're here. We're speaking from the other side of the fence. The gangbangers that are fighting against each other, the same color in the streets, the, the South Siders or wherever you're from, the blacks that are fighting against each other, when you go in the prison system, all that's out the door because you're going to team up with each other because you've got bigger issues to worry about. Those bigger issues are you got to worry about the South Siders not trying to take over and control the prison. You got the woods, you got the islanders, you got different groups of people that you have to worry about. So you're going to want to team up with your own people. So the same people that you're fighting with in the street become your brothers in prison. It's politics. And if you don't want to be part of that, then you're going to have issues. Sometimes you're forced to be in part of that group because if you're left out on the, uh, if you're left out by yourself, then that means you're open game to whoever wants you any predator that wants you, anybody that wants to extort from you, take your money, or take your manhood. And it happens in prison, believe it or not. How many people, how many kids are taking guns to school? Why would you take a gun to school? Are you gonna kill somebody? Why? Because once you pull that trigger, that bullet can't come back. Once you take that life, that life can't come back. Once you sell that drug and somebody dies from an overdose, did you know you can be charged with their murder? Did you guys know that? You can't take that back. Once you're standing in front of the judge and you're getting sentenced to 10, 20, 30 years, a life sentence, 50 years, you can't take that back. Mama can't save you. Daddy can't save you. Grandma can't save you. You can't even save yourself. This is reality. And I know the streets can be rough, and I know that we don't want, nobody wants to get bullied on the street. Nobody wants to get picked on on the street. And if I was on the street and somebody was picking on me, I would probably pick up a gun too. That's just how I grew up. But now I think about things, the consequences. How do I avoid those situations? How do I put myself out of those situations so I'm not bullied, so I'm not having to protect myself, so I'm not having to take another man's life. These are the things that you got to ask yourself. Because once you make that mistake, you're going to have 20, 30, 40 years of life sentence to think through it, but it's already too late. You can't reverse that. So you got to make that decision. Is it worth it? Of course you want to protect yourself, but you got to really ask yourself, is there another way out? And if there is, take it and run. Because, you know, you're going to have, like I said, you'll, you'll have plenty of years of regret sitting in prison thinking about the mistakes that you made and how you can turn it around. And you might not even be able to turn it around if you're never getting out. I think my time is almost up. Does anybody else have any other questions? You, oh, we got, okay, we got a little, how we doing? What brought you to Real Talk? You brought me to Real Talk. Yeah. That's He's asking me what, who, what brought me to Real Talk, and I'm telling you brought me. Because you know why? Because I got nothing but love for you, everybody here, and I don't want to see you make the same mistakes as I made, as they made. That's why we're here. All right? There's no doubt in my mind that when you go to the bottom, when you're in prison, and you see how bad it could be, you will have an extraordinary drive to make it when you get out. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Again, when, when getting out, some people have the application 
and the focus to channel that drive into extraordinary success. There are second chances for people that really want them. We really can make a difference if we want to. It's all up to us. Coming out of prison after 18 years, I was starting life over. I was 42 years old. Sleeping at my mom's two bedroom trailer sleeping on the couch. My bedroom was at the actual living room, so all my worldly possessions were in the living room on the couch, and that was my living quarters. I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have credit. And I was starting from scratch. All the drug money was gone. The houses were gone. The materialistic things were gone. But I was happy because I was free. And I felt that I was getting a second chance in life. And I was going to do all that I can do to make sure that I did it right this time.